All right, we are live. Thank you for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. This is The Journey Within, which is a journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of a death and rebirth. And today, I have a very special guest whom I'm very excited to really just dig into his his, his mind, you know, like really um, grill him for like information. I feel like this is more for me than like anyone else. So Chris Good is in the house. He is a, a transformation coach and hypnotherapist. So thank you so much for coming on, Chris. Thank you for having me, Justin. Appreciate it. Well, um, so maybe we can start just, you know, sharing just a little bit about uh, who you are and how you, you know, how do you describe what you do? Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, who I am? Well, my name is Chris Good, and uh, I, I'm a transformation coach. So I help people get from where they are to where they want to be. And uh, especially when there's let's say like a major difference between those two places there can be a lot of discomfort and pain um usually there's like that uh you could say that lack of contentment um and transformation is a process and i think a lot of us ex you know especially in western culture like things to be instantaneous and making that process more meaningful and more, what can I say, uh, more meaningful and not as unpleasant and as uncomfortable as it, uh, as we make it out to be, you know, it doesn't need to be this, um, this journey of suffering. Right. You know, there's going to be, there's certainly pain and, and there's certainly discomfort and displeasure and all those unpleasant things involved, but we don't need to make it any worse than what it needs to be. And for me, I think this process and this journey of getting to where I'm at, um, of transformation has really just been reflective of my own life, my own journey. I went through a lot of difficulty growing up. I didn't have the most comfortable childhood. Uh, I had uh, a parent who struggled with addiction and it was something that really just, she struggled with throughout her entire life. Um, and then I had uh, uh, a father who just, he, he did the best that he could in terms of raising um, young children at uh, at starting at like 60 years old, which is uh, I would not recommend um, unless you've got some serious spunk and youth in you to do that. Uh, he decided to give it a go when everyone else is like, this is a great age to start retiring. Um, and I, w I found myself in foster care. Um, I struggled with depression, um, abandonment issues and codependency. And uh, at times I, I struggled with uh, issues with substance abuse. And um, I just, I went through a lot of different things, kind of just trying to find stillness and trying to find peace. And it was just making the best of not the most optimal situation to be in. And I know it's kind of vague in general, but I'm also trying not to, you know, be too specific because I don't want to make this whole episode about just, you know, my past. Yeah. No, but I think it's, I think a lot of people can relate, you know, to the, just the pain that you went through. And what, what do you think was the point where you realize like, huh, something, something's like off here and I need to change something? Great question. Um, I would say that the, like the linchpin to change for me was, I was going to Liberty University to study to be a pastor. And at that point in my life, I was really focused in on one specific way of 
trying to experience like uh, some sort of peace, some sort of transformation in my life. And I was full on, I guess you could say only in, in to like religious dogma and spirituality. Not a bad thing. Definitely a lot of great things that came from that. But my, my mom passed away while I was oh. studying. And all of the trauma and the pain that I had experienced associated with her just flooded up to the surface. And I got uh, suicidally depressed. I was just like, I can't, I can't take this. I don't, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to live. Like it's too painful. You know, it's, I, I want to get, I want to escape from this. I want to run away but you can't run away from yourself when you're feeling this in your own body. And I just decided to ask myself, why? Like, why am I feeling this way? Like, why is it that uh, the, you know, smell or a thought or a feeling can come up and I can experience like a shift in my emotions and, and my experience in my body. And I just, wanted answers and i i definitely found some some solace and comfort in the place that i was in in terms of my uh my school uh, it was it was uh you know as as much a uh, flack that liberty university gets and reasonably so um it was comforting to know that like i could go like in, in school or something and, and somebody would offer to pray for me, like just yeah. random people. Um, and it was, uh, I was just craving for like connection and somebody, I, I was craving to be seen and to be understood uh, to, for somebody to step into my pain and experience it with me. So it wasn't mm -hmm. so lonely and yeah. that, yeah, that whole process just led to just why, why, why? And as I asked why, I was like, all right, well, you know, what's psychology and learning more about um, human behavior and why we act the way that we do. And, and maybe there's a different perspective to look at this from. Doesn't mean that, you know, other perspectives are wrong or incorrect, but as I was moving and, and shifting, um, my position to look at it from a different view, I started realizing that there were other ways to approach this so that I had a more holistic, um, yeah, just a holistic uh, perspective and approach to addressing my pain and the problems yeah. that I was dealing with. So it's like, rather than thinking from the pain, kind of almost, coming from different vantage points, different perspectives, different angles of looking at the pain. Yeah, yeah, different vantage points, um, different perspectives to look at the pain. I mean, you know, even just the simple idea of like, you know, what, you know, is, is pain a bad thing? Um, it's certainly not a welcomed experience. <laughs> I don't think anybody is like, yay, pain, give me some David Goggins, that. maybe. I don't know. Yeah, well, you know, um, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> uh, but it's your belief, your view of pain and what it can do for you can be transformative in and of itself. You know, it's uh, I almost look at it as kind of like the um, like a, a hammer, you know, and, and uh, you're being like struck on the anvil. And so you can either be, you can either participate in that process. You can be an active participant in being shaped in that, or you can decide to be passive and continue to be struck by pain. And hopefully things end up well for you. Hopefully you move in a direction that reduces that and hopefully you move in a direction that's more meaningful where you can look back on it like, wow, I'm really grateful that that happened. Uh, but it's, I think it's a lot, 
there's a lot more certainty in the sense when you're being more active in that as opposed to just allowing it to happen passively. Right. So, so um, having that suicidal depression and, yeah. and just embodying so much pain, do you think, what do you think caused you to actually take an active approach versus a passive approach? Cause I know like a lot of people, they've, they've been through a lot of shit, part of my French and it's like the world's beat them down. Like they really did have a bad lot in life and they're still suffering. So what, what do you think caused you to start to um, use that pain, I guess, and, and look at it from a different, uh, different vantage point? Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's, it's really simple as far as like pain goes, you know, you put your hand over a flame and eventually it's going to hurt to where you're going to want to move it. Like that's just, that's just how we are. That's how we're, we're wired. And I would say that that's probably a pretty good thing. Uh, probably wouldn't be alive for so long if that wasn't the case. What that was part of the reason why there was that temptation, you know, I, I think uh, when people often look at the, the idea or the notion of suicide, um, especially somebody who's never struggled with something of that nature, it's easy to be critical. It's easy to judge the person who's experiencing that and to think like, you know, how selfish, how, you know, like what, like, why would you ever consider doing something like that? There's so many other people, but uh, what they fail to see probably because they haven't experienced them themselves is that when you're in that much emotional suffering and in that depth of pain to where you feel like suicide is a, is a, is a valid option for escape. Like this might just make things better. Maybe I'll find relief if there's something on the other side or if there's, you know, maybe it's just, there's nothing. And then I'm like, that's it. You know, or you can mm. get into the scary stuff. Maybe there is something and maybe it won't work out so good. But the, the point is, um, you know, it's like thinking that that's an option to, uh, to escape the pain. Whereas, I was like, this is, this is not an option. I, I tried that. Uh, and I'm glad that I did not succeed. And I just realized that the only way that I'm going to make my life less painful is by doing something about it. Like I have to find solutions. I have to figure out what I can do to just minimize and mitigate and eliminate unnecessary pain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, what you're saying kind of reminds me of, um, I don't listen to Jordan Peterson all that much, but clips here and there. And uh, to kind of paraphrase him in this one clip, he was talking about uh, like suffering, like necessary suffering versus unnecessary suffering. And he's like, look, the reason why we do all this personal development, it's, it's so we can prevent the unnecessary suffering. Necessary suffering, hey, that's just, that's just life. But the unnecessary suffering we can do something about. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. You know, it's uh pain is is part of life. We're not going to escape it and our ability to learn to tolerate it is really helpful. Uh, I think that he definitely talks about that um throughout like his, you know, lectures and conversations and stuff. And there's exercises that we can do. Unfortunately, our contemporary society is not the best for making uh, people stronger. Like that's mm. something that you actively have to go out and do. You have to make decisions to um, expose yourself to discomfort and expose yourself to pain so that you can develop a tolerance to it. Because we're just saturated in in pleasure hmm. you can interesting you can we have the ability to escape pain uh and we can escape it so much that we can arrive back at it 
And a perfect example of that is somebody who struggles with substance abuse or uh, addiction or something of that nature. Uh, you know, drugs can provide a very pleasurable stimulus. Like they feel amazing. That's why people do them. And unfortunately, because of the way our physiology works, you get caught into a feedback loop. And it's not like a negative feedback loop where your body's like, hey, that's enough. It's like, nah, give me some more. Give me some more of that stuff. I'll, I'll take some more. And um, eventually you just, you hit a point where your your whole entire life just starts deteriorating and falling apart. You know, but there's like, if you, you know, it's like, I don't want pain. There you go. But that's not a, that's not a great option. I don't want pain. It's not a great option. No, I'm saying um, the pursuit. Like oh, sorry. Using the... substance, yeah, using substances as a means to escape pain is not a great option. Uh, even, I would say even the idea of, you know, I'm, I'm careful like the way that I, I say, you know, it's transforming pain and stress into a source of power and self-acceptance. Because I don't think that escaping pain is possible. And I don't think that it's wise either. In mm. fact, I think that in the attempt to escape from those things, we actually create more pain and more suffering. Interesting. Um, so is the only, or not say the only, is the best option simply to embrace the pain? And if that if that's so, how do we how do we begin to do that? As at this moment, I I think so. I think so. And of course, my views can change in time and stuff. I mean, they're, you know, I might look back at this five years from now and be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, the things that I'm learning and uh, like where I'm at in life right now, it, it seems to be the case. It seems to be what's working. Um, and learning to accept discomfort, learning to accept unpleasant emotions and experiences. It doesn't mean that you approve of them. I'm not saying that you're like, that's okay. I'm not going to do anything about that. But it's recognizing this is reality. Like this is, uh, you know, maybe you're going through some difficult situation with a with a relationship, you know, unless you can do something to flip a switch or change something so that it's immediately fixed. Why trouble yourself more by being frustrated over something that you can't change immediately, accept it. And then put your attention towards what can be a solution. And even if you solve the problem, there may still be some degree of pain that comes from that experience. And our unwillingness to be accepting of that puts us into a state of trying to escape. And the more you try to escape from life, the more you will suffer. Hmm. So I think this, um, when, when I started to get into acceptance work, meditation, Sedona method, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it really confused me a lot. You know, the whole Buddhist mentality. It's like, okay, yeah. um, if, if I accept something, I'm not trying to escape it, then why do anything about it? Yeah. Yeah. Why do I anything reconcile about it? it? Yeah. Well, I think, I think part of it is uh, that you know, we're trying to communicate something right now that people will get caught up in the language and they'll miss out on the reality. That's why I love this, uh, the Zen saying, you know, it's like uh, language is like a finger pointing at the moon. Hmm. It doesn't mean that you're just you know, if you see something terrible happening, it doesn't mean you don't do anything about it. It doesn't mean that you don't put your life, uh, 
you know, you don't put your life in order. You don't fix things. You don't, you know, like you're, you're not just this passive observer allowing things to just happen. That's not acceptance. And I wouldn't even say like uh, the idea of like contentment, you know, which I think is like one of the most undervalued virtues. It's probably one of the most important and it's the most undervalued. In fact, it's crazy. People today think that it's a bad thing. Like, what are you talking about? What? It's like, what, you know, yeah, it's like, I'm like, what do you mean? Who thinks it's a bad thing? Oh, Uh, I think uh, I could see that. Where it's like, hustle culture. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, man, you need to grind. You need to beat yourself up. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no, you're, you know, you're like, really, you're just, you're being, it's like, that's greed. And you're trying to take more than what you really need. You're, you're not being okay with this and being resourceful with this. And maybe that's, I don't know, that's kind of coming up for me right now. It's just this idea of like adaptability and resourcefulness. I, I'm not a big fan of the word <laughs> resourceful, but uh, no. adaptable, I, I just, because I think adaptable makes it, it, it kind of, it's a little bit more pointed like, Oh yeah. Okay. I see what you're saying and stuff. I I suppose resourceful being that you're using what's available to you, but being accepting is, is using what's available to you. It's being adaptable to the situation and not making it more difficult than it needs to be because the opposite of that is resisting it. You're not willing to accept what's going on and if you're not willing to accept the reality of the situation, you're going against the grain of life. Hmm. That's not going to be a very comfortable experience. What are some ways that, you know, we can experience acceptance or experience, you know, the reality of uh, being able to embrace that pain that like you meant, you mentioned some exercises. Yeah. Um, so things that we can actively do in order to enhance our ability to be more accepting. Well, one thing that immediately comes to mind is meditation. You know, a lot of people, they'll be like, yeah, no, I don't, you know, I don't want to do that. I can't sit still and stuff. I'm like, that's exactly why you need to do that. <laughs> hey, I was that way. I'm still yeah, that way. I'm like, I'm like, that's exactly because it, like I can't sit still. There we go. Like you want to have a practice in your life where you are actively engaging that discomfort, where you're working towards enhancing your ability to to stand in uneasiness longer, to be more accepting. And I would say to be more loving because I think they go hand in hand. And yeah. that's really how you move from, you know, it's like that, that is in a, in essence, it's self-acceptance. Can you tolerate yourself? You know, or are you in so much pain and discomfort that you want to move, that you want to run away from yourself, escape? I mean, you need to either move to substances to change the feelings in your body, or you feel like ending your life because you can't tolerate the way that you feel. Hmm. For for people who, so let's say they, they understand, hey, okay, I got to meditate. You know, that would be good for me. All right. So we have to accept what comes to us in life, accept the pain. Is that sufficient there for them to to start to really uh, transform that? It can be, but I would also say that it's important to have the right understanding, you know, because you can do the exercises like you can it, meditation being one of them, of course, and um, there's others that I can mention as well. But let's say you're meditating and you know, you meditate for a week and you're, you know, you're still in pain, you're frustrated, you're angry, you're shaking your fists at the heavens. You're like, you know, damn this all, I can't stand it. Well, 
you're not giving yourself the time to change. It's a process. It, the way that we often think in Western society is it, everything is very yes, no, black, white. We don't like the discomfort of paradox and we don't like the we don't like the unknown like everything has to be certain and we have a hard time uh allowing there to really be like spectrums you know processes becomings uh, it's it's just not we aren't really raised to think that way like you're either a good person or you're a bad person you know, you're evil or you're good you know it's like it's either this or it's that it's yes or no you're either my friend or you're not my friend but it, there's gradients and there's this allowing which again plays into acceptance and plays into love where you're becoming a person you're becoming a, a different kind of person. You're transforming. There's some interesting uh, ancient Greek like paradoxes that philosophers would bring up. You know, it's like how many um, specks of sand does it require for there to be a heap of sand? You know, what speck does the does the sand become a heap? Or if you take a there there was some ship I can't recall the name where. They preserved the ship, but they replaced a board of wood. And, and they, they, they ended up replacing all the boards of wood. Well, is it still the same ship? Or is it a different ship? Heraclitus said this, um, this famous thing where he's like, you know, no man steps into the, the same river twice. There's still the river, but it's constantly changing. We do not like that, that idea. And so when it comes down to this, um, you know, this, is that sufficient? It's a process and it's being accepting of that process. Every moment, allowing a little bit more to be different, a little bit more to change. It doesn't need to be some final judgment. You've done it. You've crossed the finish line. It's like, no, no, it's, you're, you're, there's change. Everything is changing. Everything's changing. I have a, a, a curious question concerning, you know, people who are dealing with developmental trauma. Um, do you think for them that, that are really, they're, they're truly trying to accept, they're doing the practices, they're going to therapy and all of that. For people with trauma, do you think they will, I guess, ever cross the finish line, so to speak? Um, I think that it's certainly possible to, to move beyond a place where trauma is noticeably affecting you. You know, where you're... Uh, you're just being so overwhelmed by the experiences of your past because it's like, it's implicit memory. It's like wrapped up into your body. You know, you might not even think about it. Uh, and, and, you know, for those of you listening who struggle with this, don't, don't feel bad about feeling bad. It's like, this is something I'm still working on myself. Uh, and a lot of people are, and that's okay. Like, that's just okay. It's a process. What I will say, though, is that you know, I recently went, went through something. I, I found out something about myself. I can't share it publicly just because there's like other people involved. But uh, it was, oh, my goodness, very traumatizing mm. because it sort of changed the paradigm of my whole life. Nothing changed physically, but it just sort of immediately rewrote the whole story. And I was like, whoa whoa now because of that event because of what had happened uh, i was in a lot of pain and 
from that pain, I was like, I, I, I like something's got to change. I have to figure something out. So I immediately started doing research on alternative. Sorry about that. I immediately started doing some research on some alternative forms of, uh, I could say, um, treatment for like uh, trauma and depression and things of that nature. And I ended up finding some things that worked out extremely well for me. But that's by having a solution oriented mindset. It's, it's, you know, if you're suffering or you're in pain, yes, take note of the pain, you know, be aware of like, oh my gosh, like, you know, I've got a gash in my leg or like I'm emotionally wounded. Okay. Like that's, that's real. Accept it. Now, what can you do to eliminate it? Like, what can you do to resolve that? and then start doing the work and some things can provide us with instantaneous relief it just seems to me though that the things that are really worthwhile and meaningful are the ones that take time hmm. now i'm curious like you know what are these secret really amazing uh things you found out that gave you relief um you're talking about the uh, alternative treatments that i that i yeah. did okay uh yeah. so there was there was three treatments that i looked into um one was uh ketamine infusion therapy and i've had my fair share of delving into the realm of psychedelics to address um depression trauma things of that nature uh, to great benefit and also to great detriment like definitely mm. be careful with approaching that stuff. Um, that is not condoning, <laughs> condoning the use. Only do it if it's legal. Um, right. This is not medical <laughs> advice. This is not psychological yeah, advice. Yeah. Please Bio consult a professional. Yeah. Exactly that deal. Um, but uh, the the ketamine was pretty profound. It, it it was like almost an instantaneous alleviation of that experience that I had just mentioned. Uh, I did something called a SGB shot. It's called uh, stellate ganglion block. There's a nerve bundle in your neck called the stellate ganglion, which they found that when they apply an anesthetic to it, it actually can help reset your fight and flight system. Huh. And there's a relatively high degree of people who have a major reduction in anxiety and, and other uh, experiences associated with PTSD. So uh, that was really helpful. Like it, it, it pretty much brought me from a state of being like, oh my gosh, like I can't, like this is overwhelming to, okay, back to normal. And uh, then I did something called transcranial magnetic stimulation, which uh, is pretty amazing. It's TMS for short, they put a, MRI helmet on your head and they beam magnetic resonancy uh, into a part of your brain that is underused for those who are experiencing depression and anxiety, as well as a host of other issues. Like they can use it for, they're experimenting with, um, for people with schizophrenia, for OCD, for ADHD. Huh. And it's pretty amazing. You know, the, the way I would sort of describe it, it's like uh, going to practice batting and within a 20 minute span, it's like you swung 1000 to 2000 times. And you do that for about six weeks, um, five days a week for just like 20 minutes. And it, it probably was one of the most beneficial things that I've done for, for myself. Wow. Yeah. Well, maybe I need to look into that. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Um, so you, you talked about um, kind of going back to what you were saying about a solution focused mindset or solution oriented mindset. Yeah. How do we how do we develop like what is that? Maybe you can expound on that. Like, how do we develop that kind of mindset? Uh, it's. It's. It's a process. Uh, part of that process is. Uh, first, recognizing uh, how how your mind is right now. You know, are you do you find yourself always putting your attention 
and most often putting your attention towards everything that's wrong with your life. You know, I'll, I'll say that there's things in my life right now that if they were different, I'm sure I would feel more comfortable. I'm sure I wouldn't, it wouldn't be so unpleasant for me. And I could constantly put my attention on that and be frustrated about it and be bitter and resistant to it. Or even though it's uncomfortable, even though it kind of adds this sort of dull, unpleasant experience to my life, if I draw my attention towards resolving those things and put my energy towards that, then over time, that will be gone. Like it's not going to be a thing. And guess what? I will feel so much better from it. And the same goes for everyone. You know, it's like there's, unfortunately, there's some things that we do have to live with. There's things that have just sort of, in a sense, been given to us. Like some people deal with disabilities and handicaps, or they deal with, uh, you know, undesirable family situations, or they deal with uh, undesirable economic situations. And it's really unfortunate that people have to experience those things. But the best thing that we can do is put our attention on what is it that we have? Like, what do I have to work with right now? And then what can I do with this to make my life a little bit better? To make it a little less painful. Stop focusing on the people on Instagram or social media or, you know, who's the hottest guy or gal or the richest that or it, it doesn't matter. Focus on what it is that you can do with your life. And then hopefully, as you find yourself getting better and better, there's some wisdom that you can take from your experiences and then share that with others so that they can apply it to their life in their own unique way. So you, you mentioned um, some other exercises other than meditation, excuse yeah. me, that that like maybe you do and maybe we can copy um would you share a little bit about some of those exercises um i'm a big fan of the wim hof method so pranayama uh breathing style there's some great videos like tutorials on youtube that anyone can watch but it's a breathing technique where you breathe in deep and then you let go and you do that for I think it's like 40 to 60 times. And then on the final breath, you completely breathe all the way out to where your lungs are empty and you just sit there. And at the end, you'll start feeling discomfort. Like you're like, you want to take in a, a deep breath and that's a really good place to be because when you do finally take in that breath, and, and you do, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> you will you, live. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you will live. But it, what a great, a great thing, because, you know, that discomfort, like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to die. This is it. Like, it's over. It's like, no, it's, it, it's, that's probably not the case. Like, that's probably not the case. And by being able to sit there, you know, with, with your lungs empty, and then finally take in that deep breath, to hold it in and then go back. It feels so good. You get this huge release of um, endorphins and norepinephrine and everything. And it just like supercharges you. I love doing it in the morning uh, for myself personally. I found it to be really useful. It's a great tool. I like doing it before I meditate because it just like clears your mind. Mm -hmm. And the, the other things taking like doing some uh, form of like cold showers or cold immersion, people hate that. There's another reason why you need to do that because that when you say, I don't want to do that, that is either implicitly or explicitly an admission to an intolerance of, of pain and discomfort, which means that that would be a good thing for you. And obviously, you know, some people, uh, they, you know, they can do cold water things. Some people can't because of, you know, different conditions and stuff. So check with your doctor about jazz, but right. um, do what makes sense for you. Uh, other things could be like fasting. I mean, come on now. 
like a lot of, a, and I'm not just talking about fasting food, which is really good for you, by the way. But what about fasting music or fasting television or fasting something that you are just inundated with, overstimulated by? Hmm. For, for someone who doesn't have the discipline, so like, you know, hey, I'm going to be real. Like, I don't want to fast coffee. <laughs> I'm good with that attachment yeah. right now. Um, but for someone who doesn't necessarily, you know, have the discipline, because I know, like, I would want to try to do things like I'm going to force myself to read and, and take cold showers or whatever, whatever it is. And I end up like failing. I'm like, God damn it. Um, what advice could you give to these people who are they're, they're trying and they're like, man, I just like, I know these things are good for me, but uh, I'm just, it doesn't seem like I'm able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, don't, don't, try to do all of these things at once <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you know I mean, like it's it's it, it there's almost like the this part of, like your character your your it's like your psyche you know your soul your inner being is in a way a lot like the body if you i don't think that they're as different as people tend to think of them um, and when we push our body too hard, it breaks. And if you push your psyche too hard, it breaks. So it's important to have some sort of exercise, something to introduce slowly. And it doesn't have to be a big thing. You know, maybe you can only meditate for five minutes or three minutes. Great. You do that for a month and then you know, notice how you feel and try to do a little bit more and try to do a little bit more and progress. Like it, it doesn't have to be this immediate thing. And we don't, you don't see people, uh, you know, it's like a tree that's growing. You don't see people trying to uh, climb a sapling. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. They like to try to climb the big, strong trees. Well, a big tree didn't get that way overnight. It took time. Mm -hmm. So give yourself time. Just make sure that yeah. you give yourself the right environment and the right tools to do that in the most optimal fashion as possible and give yourself grace and compassion when you do uh you know fail to be consistent or uh things don't turn out necessarily the way that you want i love that it's good advice um Going back to, to pain and these different exercises like meditation, the Wim Hof breathing and, and cold showers and cold baths, which I have yet to take um, soon, hopefully. Um, do, do these exercises and this uh, the philosophy of acceptance and allowing, because we've been talking about emotional pain, do these mm -hmm. things also work for physical pain in your experience and research? Um, absolutely. So there, it's interesting. There's uh, physical pain and emotional pain are a lot more related than what people think. They, they're both uh, uniquely subjective experiences. They've done research where um, I believe it was people who had slipped discs or there was something wrong with discs in their spinal cord and they gave people a placebo shot and then a cement filling uh, in their spinal cord. And even the some of the people who got the cement uh, filling uh, still felt pain. But interestingly enough, some of the people who got the placebo shot in their spinal cord ended up not feeling any more pain. And it just like it stopped wow. at, at all. And it, it's it's like, well, obviously, it's not a physiological issue. It wasn't because they, you know, it's like some sort of nerve or something's like, hey, you're hurting. It's like, no, they, they, something changed in the way that they're perceiving their pain and it stopped. And there's uh, this technique called sensory focus, which we kind of alluded to a little bit earlier, which is where you, it's like you put your attention on the pain that you're experiencing and you just accept it. 
You don't try to change it. You don't try to make it something else. And research has shown that through that process, it will actually reduce the experience of pain, the experience of discomfort. Wow. Yeah. Some crazy stuff. The placebo <laughs> yeah. effect, man. It's, um, you know, I think people have a, a, in my opinion, they have a skewed view of the placebo effect. It's like, dude, this is like, it actually works. It's not like, I think people they use it flippantly in, in yeah. everyday language. Oh, just a placebo effect. Like, no, dude, I don't know how, how amazing you, you know, that actually, like you think that is, or you don't yeah. know how amazing that is. Right. So it actually produces changes in your brain. It's just yeah. amazing. Yeah. 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 I, I definitely agree with that. It's so funny when I read uh, research forms and somebody's talking about an experiment and it's just like, ah, oh, well, it's, you know, it's just the placebo. And I'm like, it's not just the placebo. It's the placebo. Respect it. <laughs> yeah. Respect the placebo. That's what I'm going to rename this. Respect yeah. the placebo. I like that. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, I, I want to hit on uh, maybe a slightly different topic here, but um, yeah. definitely a source of pain for, for myself and for a lot of people. And I know that you've helped people overcome uh, procrastination. Um. Maybe you could share about like what like why do we procrastinate and and what do you know what can we do about it? Well, there's a there's a lot of reasons people procrastinate. Um, you know, aside from somebody experiencing like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or you know some issue where like a neurological disorder, oftentimes it's related to stress and pain. And it's procrastination is almost a form of trying to actively dissociate from the experience of discomfort and pain. When you are feeling like you have a hard time, uh, like you're having a hard time focusing on things then it's, it's good to take a step back and to ask yourself if you're putting too much on your plate. You know, maybe you're not having good boundaries. Maybe you're, take, you're you know, biting off more than you can chew. And also, if there's things in your life that if you resolve them and did not add more to it, that it would eliminate you from like being able to take action. See what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's almost like we put so much on our plates that like, we're stressed out. I can't do this. Mm -hmm. Like, this is too much. I'm like, I'm feeling the, the burden and the weight of all my responsibility. And it's too much to bear because I don't feel like I can respond to it. Like, I don't think I can, I mean, you know, it's like, I don't think I can take action and resolve these issues. This is why growing that tolerance for discomfort will allow you to push through that. But it's also important that you're not adding to it after you get rid of it. Because if you've got the procrastination, you've, you've hit a limit. Some, psychologically, you've hit a limit of sorts. Hmm. You know, you're, you're taking a step back. And one thing, I, people are going to hate me for doing this, but it's, <laughs> I, I do this. I, I, I'm going to preface it with this. I do this too. But you know that you're in discomfort or stress when you find yourself constantly moving to your phone and just hitting a social media button for no reason. You're, you're actively dissociating. You're, you're procrastinating. You're trying to, to step outside of the discomfort that you're feeling within. Mm, I do that. Yeah. I find too. myself, I'm just like, why am I... Oh. <laughs> I'm not even like actually looking at anything. I'm literally just mindlessly scrolling. Like, what am yeah. I doing? Yeah. 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 Oh. Okay. Um, last question, man. If if you could go back in time and, and just give yourself advice, like a young Chris, what would you say to him? I, 
I, I think more than anything, I just, I would just tell him that, uh, like, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's advice that, um, he needs, like, I, I don't think it's advice. I think it's an experience. Uh, and I, if anything, I would just give him, um, a hug and I would tell him that it's, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I just, I felt like a restless spirit back then. I just couldn't stop. I was just trying to grab for peace. But you don't find peace trying to escape the pain. Interestingly enough, you find peace by going through the pain and being yeah. still with it. It's powerful, man. I like it. Um, I've said this on a, on a on a previous podcast, but uh, I don't even know if this is really roomy. You know, it's just purported to be roomy. But um, the quote goes: uh, "The answer to the pain is within the pain." Yeah, which is like it hit. It's that quote's going to stick with me. So, yeah, yeah, that's a great quote. Um, awesome. Well, Chris, um, where can people uh, find you and, and contact you if they want to work with you? Um, uh, I am Chris Good for like all my social media handles. Uh, my website, I am chrisgood.com. You can send me a message on one of those. Uh, there should be like some sort of link tree, acuity scheduling link that you can you know, schedule a time with me for a a free session and um yeah you know it's uh don't be uh, don't be concerned um about about money either you know it's one thing that really troubles me with the coaching community uh, so you know reach out to me and um talk to me and and we'll you know we'll discuss things and see how we can we can work yeah. Chris, appreciate you coming on. And I know um, people watching will appreciate this, man. You, you're you just this, like, you're this wealth of knowledge, but you also have this just warm heart. You know, so it's like the best combination. So thank you, <laughs> appreciate man. Appreciate it. Thank you, man. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys. Peace out. <laughs>